Welcome back. This is uh, number two, the second episode of our Dogbone podcast here. And I first off want to thank you for listening. If you made it through the first one, uh, we did our best. I did my best to try to keep <laughs> we it survived together. as short as possible. <laughs> yeah, I didn't think there was an issue with that. I think the the biggest struggle that I'll have with these uh, being a new platform for us is the time constraint. And it's not necessarily that we're held to it, but I think we're going to try to. I think it's a lot easier for us to and more manageable to be able to tackle topics this way and um, be able to be maybe less general, less broad, but more specific and more in depth on on specific questions. Last time, we kind of made we used the opportunity in the beginning to kind of explain how we're just not sure how these will shake out, and I don't know that we are yet either. But uh, to the, to this point, but I did kind of like the idea of hitting on common questions or questions that we have received and I think are real good questions. Um, We get a ton of them. So Mm -hmm. I like that. I think that's, I think that's part of what we're trying to do is be able to provide not just tools. I think our tools work. I, you know, I know they work. I think it's information to support them that I think is equally as valuable, maybe more valuable to some people. And I think sometimes the topics aren't going to be so specific. They're not going to be specific to shed hunting or, bird dog training or gun dog training so um i liked it i liked the way first one went i think we were going to kind of continue with it yeah i thought it was good so but uh i i do you know yeah let's go right i guess get right into it um yeah we'll try to stay concise to the point get to training questions and you guys make sure to keep sending them because that's how we're going to be able to build this too. Yeah, yeah, I think that's where the value is going to be. So we're gonna we're gonna continue that. So go ahead. I I, I picked um a, a it was a actually wild and crazy kid, psycho was, dog. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> I don't. This wasn't from a kid, was it? No, I'm I'm talking about the dog. The oh, dog is the kid. Yeah. No, I I a little think bit wild. this was a message that was relatively recent. When was the date on it? February thirteenth. So it was a week ago, a little mm-hmm. over a week ago. And I thought it was a good one. Um, I just scrolled through some of our uh, the old messages that had come through, handpicked a couple that I thought were, were good. I didn't really read read them fresh, so I'm going to let – because I don't – one of the things that I don't want this to turn into is I don't want it to turn into like, a, hey, we, we, we have this routine. Yeah, we're not or, scripted. That would, I would just like, be weird. It's very similar to um, a seminar. Like I don't have – I've got a general direction, but, boy, they always go their own own way so i think if we keep it that way it'd be more candid and a little more um better i'll i'll give you better if i have time to think about stuff i feel like i overthink things at times let me read the question so go ahead (laughs) go ahead okay so the question is i have a five-month-old britney spaniel i need help with my dog he's absolutely out of control and i don't know where i've gone wrong oh we hear that a lot I can't sit on the floor without him attacking me. He wants to bite at me and hump me. <laughs> Ayo. I think he is playing, but it actually hurts me. He chews on everything and he steals stuff off the counter and runs under my bed to hide them. He is very smart and knows what he is doing wrong, but he thinks it's a game. I've watched your puppy training DVD and it's very helpful, but I can't get him to calm down unless I throw him in the kennel. Everything I read about hyper dogs say he is not getting enough exercise, so putting him in the kennel is making it worse, I think. Do you have any tips or help for me? Yeah. So this is I a do. very multifaceted question. Yeah, there's just tons, like the first there's one. tons of stuff to it. <laughs> and I love it. And I, I love the idea of it. I think so so there's there's a bunch of stuff here. First off, similar to the last one, uh, the the first episode of this, when we talked about that guy's dog, we we brought up the idea of age. And I said, and that I think it was eighteen months old in the last one. And I said 18 months old is a puppy. Now, I think I also said something about, you know, 18 months is old in comparison to a lot of the questions and the comments and the stuff I hear when people are talking about their dogs. This one is five months, right? It's Mm -hmm. five months old. So we're talking super puppy. Like we're, we're talking, you got it when it was two months old. You've only had it for three months. So one of the things that's really alarming and stands out to me is first off, like you've got a, 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 when it comes to you, these dogs come to you. They're, they're I like to call them like a blank slate. They have they have they don't have a ton of history. Like they just don't they haven't been walking around but for a couple of weeks when they first come to you. So they really can't get into nearly as much trouble as as they can if you wait three, four, five, six weeks. In this case, you're let's see, you're twelve weeks past 
five months old is roughly 20 months, 20 weeks. So you got it when it was like eight weeks. So you're like 12, 13 weeks of habits that have formed since the pup came to your house. Now they're really cute when they come to your house and they don't, they're not real mobile. And they, so we, we have to, I think, realize when these dogs come to our house, that's, that's really a nice time to start forming and instilling some good habits. Like I, I talk a lot about building habits. Training is nothing more than forming a habit. Habits are formed by repetition and consistency. So we talk about that. Well, your pup is really little yet. Like that, that pup is really small. Um, physically, what was it? A Brittany or a Springer? Brittany. Brittany Spaniel. So physically, it's probably pretty little as well. Now, you've got issues. Like you've got major issues. And so when I say, first off, I on one hand, I go, it's really young. And, and you know, don't hit the panic button quite yet. Because it is very young, and you've got a lot of opportunity to reverse some of the bad stuff you've put in and start forming the stuff you really want. On the other hand, I say, like, really, you've got to get after it, like, right now. Like, this has to be life changing majorly for this dog because if you are describe the way you're describing it, the problems, the issues, the things that you're having, first off, I will tell you this. I mean, you can only learn so much after reading a paragraph or two of what their what their message is. But I can tell real quickly by the tone of some of the messages that I get, some of them are very frustrated. Like, I don't sense as much frustration with this one. Uh, I sense a lot of uh, no control, like loss complete. Read it again one time. Yeah, and, and I think just to set the stage for it, if you visualize, she says, I can't sit on the floor without him attacking me. He's pulling stuff off the counters. He chews on everything. He runs under my bed to hide them. And the first thing I think of is the dog's five months old, and this is just setting the stage for our house. How often do we let puppies run around totally. for one? And how totally. often do we sit on the floor with them? And <laughs> totally. Back, so back up. Yeah. Read, read the whole thing right from the start so that this is, ex- this is exactly – and, I, you know, you read it with emotion and stuff. So I, I skew messages. Like I read a message and I read it. Do you want me it. to read a, a question and then I'll stop at it? So – she no, says, I just, I, just read the whole thing because I want people to get the whole thing. I have a five-month-old Brittany Spaniel. I need help with my dog. He's out of control, and I don't know where I've gone wrong. I can't sit on the floor without him attacking me. He wants to bite at me and hump me. He thinks he's playing, but he's hurting me. He chews on everything and steals stuff off the counter and runs under my bed to hide them. He's very smart and knows what he's doing wrong, but I think he thinks it's a game. I watched your puppy training DVD, and it's very helpful, but I can't get him to calm down unless I throw him in the kennel. Everything I've read about hyper dogs says he's not getting enough exercise, so putting him in the kennel is making it worse, I think. Do so, you have any tips or help? So first off, like this is concise. Like this person wrote a very well written email. Like it's not the 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 punk like the punctuation is good unless you read it better than it is. I mean, did you read like they they have their wording right? Like I, I get some email some messages that are Lots of exclamation points and capital letters. I get. Are there any in this one? Mm-hmm. I get some that are LOL. They'll say something LOL. They'll say something LOL. They'll say. It. So I read how people send a message to me, and I get a feel for the situation. I don't sense. I sense some fr- some frustration, not to the point of like breaking down mentally. I don't think she's breaking. Da- this person isn't breaking down. They're not. They're not. They're not borderline. I got to get rid of this dog. I get some people that I, that I get, uh, I can just tell they're angry. Like, they're just angry. I don't think that's it. I get some people that are really, you know, they know what they want, but they get, uh, like my, like I can envision, they're the kind of people that would tell me something and then they'd laugh about it. And I personally can't take someone serious with their problem if they read about the problem and then it's a laughter after it because I go either maybe you're just uncomfortable with with something and that's why you laugh that's your personality but with this situation like I think this person has complete loss of control and they totally understand it like they totally get it because of the way she has explained first off she's there's a lot of stuff there she spelled it out like she thought about this for a while and she wrote this message and she explained the ups and the downs and she told the full story. So that's my takeaway from it. Now, the upside about this, the good part about this is the way I'm reading that, like I think she could fix it if she knew how. I don't think she knows how. Like based on reading that, I don't think she has a freaking clue right now. And so 
here's so now if we break it down one of the things you said right away was he what was he jumps on me and bites on me or what was it about yeah when she's sitting on the floor he jumps all over bites her and humps her her, okay so first off body language like so now this person needs to change so I, i always talk about changing the culture like you need to Change the culture in your house. That's what you have to do. Right now, you have a five-month-old dog that probably thinks you're kind of fun sometimes. You're kind of a pain in the butt sometimes. You're kind of annoying sometimes. You're kind of all right when you feed it. So you've got a dog now. It also, she also said something in there. She's very smart. The dog's very smart. What is that? Yeah, she said he knows what he's doing wrong, but he thinks it's a game. Totally. So you have a you have a little. Dog yeah, he, he that, runs and steals stuff off the counter and then goes and hides it under her bed. So lots of, lots of, I see a kid that is very undisciplined. Like we used the word discipline and we did an explanation of the importance of discipline. And where I say discipline is not punishment. Discipline is respect and trust and confidence and all that stuff. That's the discipline that I'm talking about in this situation. You have a undisciplined dog. And so... What you need to do is you need to start setting yourself up as a true leader. Like they look for leaders. They want a leader. If they don't find one, they become one. That's just evolution. That's how dogs are wired. So what that dog needs is someone to step up in its life and basically take the reins and go, no, that's not how we do it. This is how we do it. So it's really easy for me to explain that to a person because they talk the same language as me. The dog doesn't. So me taking this little puppy that just stole my stuff and ran off and and plays keep away and runs into the bedroom and hides under the bed, I can't take that puppy and go, no, that's not how we do it. This isn't the way we do things around here. It doesn't understand me. So the dog that jumps up on me when I'm laying on the ground and nips at me and bites at me and pumps me, I can't say no little dog, that's not what we do things around here. This is how we need to behave because it doesn't understand. So what you have to do is you have to show it. So first off, it, it's a thing that we, we talk about a lot is setting yourselves up for success. You can set yourself up to fail oftentimes and that's usually where the failure comes. So in this situation, let's break it down by the beginning of it. Dog does what while she sits on the ground? How does it read that? Will you read that one to me? I can't sit on the floor without him attacking me. He wants you sh- to bite at me. So stop me. right there. You shouldn't sit on the floor. What are you sitting on the floor for? So when you get down to their level, you are physically telling them, I'm I'm at your level or maybe even below. Like lay down on the ground and roll around and watch a little dog jump up on top of you. Watch how quickly they will. So it's body language. And and I've talked about this recently because I don't know what it, it, uh, it usually comes up when people talk about dogs putting paws up on jumping up. Uh, when they're little or when they're older and they just constantly want to put themselves up on top of you when you're laying on your couch and the dog wants to lay on top of you. Well, here's like fundamental things that if you do them, you're basically telling your dog something. And if it were translated into human, it would be instead of me saying, no, you can't do that. We don't do that stuff around here. You'd be saying, yes, you can do whatever you want to me. Take advantage of me and you know, I'll do it. I'll do whatever you want. Laying down on the ground and having the dog get up on top of you is saying, you do whatever you want to me. So you're like, you're physically saying stuff to the dog without using words. And so when they're little like that and they want to get excited, we all boil over. Like little, little, little dogs get to the point where they get so excited that they'll boil over. And if they boil over, you've lost all control. So I bet you when all this stuff happens, when you sit down on the ground, I bet you your tone, I think it maybe gets a little bit like this. I use that to my advantage. When I want to get a dog to come to me, when I need a dog to get to do something for me, I'll change my tone and be very, oh, and they come, oh, they're very interested. And they come running over to me. Well, it's to a certain point before I'll go, ah, 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 and I'll get them to kind of ramp back down. So when we get this little dog, I bet you the tail goes fast, the excitement comes, and all of a sudden we reach a point of where I call boiling over. And when, once it's boiled over, man, you're getting nothing out of it. So don't set yourself up to fail. Stand up, stand up. You're bigger than your dog. Walk over to your dog. Or if you want to get the dog to come to you, just crouch down a little bit. Like I, I teach puppies to come to me using, I'm not a treat trainer, but I use a little bit of kibble 
to get little puppies to come to me and I physically will get down, lower myself down, become real welcoming to them and get them to come to me. When they come, I'll give them a little piece of kibble. But then I stand back up pretty quickly. I don't get down, give them a kibble, then lay down and let them jump on top of me. Because what's going to happen is you're going to boil them over and you're physically showing them, hey, you can walk all over me. Literally. You can. There's a reason why we use the terms we use. Like when you get walk, if someone walks all over you, what does that mean? What does that They're mean? Taking advantage. taking advantage of you. So when you lay down on the ground and the dog walks all over you, literally, that's where that comes from. Like they're taking advantage of you. You have no control of that situation. When watch 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 guys, watch politicians. They'll come up to each other. They'll shake each other's hand. It's a respect thing. That's body language. But then one of them almost always will take his hand and he'll put it up on the other one's shoulder. And so what does the next guy? What does that other guy do? He puts his hand up on the other guy's shoulder. What are the, what are we what are the, why do you do that? Because when you've got your hand up on somebody, when you've got a leg up on somebody, like that's I think a saying. Well, you got a leg up on them. What does a leg up on them mean? Where does it come from? The leader's gonna put their leg up on someone. I do it with my dogs. I'll watch TV at night. I'll put their place beds down in front of me, and I will literally take my foot and I'll just rest it on top of them. I got a leg up on them, and if they don't squirm out. That tells me they're, they're okay with me being the boss. If you, let, if you test, test this tonight, if you're listening, test this tonight. Put your dog down in front of you. Have it lay, lay on a spot. I, we, we place train them. Put them on place. Take your foot and just rest your foot on their back. Not fast. Not you Just gently put it up. Set it on them. Don't say a word. It's just body language. And if your dog scurries out from underneath you, you know what? He's telling you something. You're not going to dominate me. You're not going to be one leg up on me. So if your dog takes it, sometimes sometimes dogs will roll over on their back. And then they're really submitting to you. So every dog's a little bit different. But this lady, if she, it's a lady, I think, that wrote this yeah, thing. Yeah, her name's Hannah. So if she puts her foot up on that puppy. Guess what that puppy's going to do? That puppy's going to squirt out of there and go, not a chance. You're no way. Now, so physically, try this. Walk up to that little dog and stand over the top of it. And you don't have to be mean, but if, if the dog gets super, super excited, ah, 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 and as soon as the dog starts to do what you want it to do, which to me would be maybe a little focus, a little in the eyes, sit down maybe, then I'd say, good, good. Some dogs, the reward is this, good, good. You hear how soft that is? Like some dogs that are real lethargic and I got to get them going, good boy, that's a good boy, yeah, 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 yeah. And all of a sudden, da, 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 da. but when they get too high, good. The praise doesn't have to, you shouldn't boil them over. So that's part of her, part of her issue. It's just establishing yourself as a leader for this little dog. This little dog right now is going, screw you, I'm taking over. I mean, you, it, it's real, real simple when it comes to that part of it. Yeah, and I think, part of going back and maybe you can explain this more because we obviously have different wants and needs when it comes to our dogs you're very strong with them in the field and I'm the one that would love to cuddle up and lay on the floor with them and it it sounds like Hannah here is in a similar situation where she has a new dog it's a young dog I just want to be able to lay with her on the floor and play and and she might be the one instigating that Hannah might the owner she totally is because that's what she foresees as being a dog owner but you also have to think about it is this dog doesn't know right from wrong right now. And it's just like going back to our kids like we do all the time. If all of a sudden you tell your four-year-old that they can have ice cream for dinner every night for three weeks straight, and then all of a sudden one day you say, well, we can't have ice cream for dinner. That's not dinner. They're going, well, why not? Like, that's what I know. And and so this this sense is, is trying to, and I, I get where you're at, Hannah, if you're listening to this or anybody else, but I'm that person too that wants to cuddle with our dogs, that wants to do all of that. And Taylor and I do all the time, but we didn't until she was at least, what, two years old? I mean, we yeah, we built I, that foundation with her and we didn't do any of this stuff. And I don't think you're cool. And, and so I think you're right. And I think part of it needs to be understood. Like, I think people look at me with dog stuff because I, I, I pride myself on consistency. Like, I try to be very consistent. And I try to, like, show consistency because I think consistency is really important. But I also think some people think it's black and white when it comes to training. Like I think it's, there is zero, uh, you have to be a leader. So you have to be stern and you have to be bold and you have to be, no, like my kid is, 
Mason's 16 years old. Our son is 16 years old. I feel like he's my best friend. Like, my, he's probably my best friend of guy buddies. He's my best friend. But I also think I'm his dad. And so there is a clear difference between me and him relationship-wise if we're buddies or if we're dad and son. And so I'm always going to be his buddy. I always want to be his buddy. I want him to trust me and believe me and he can come to me with anything. Like that's, that's big. I want that. I have to have that. Like that's just me personally. But I also am not always so buddy-buddy with him that when, things, when I'm doing something that he doesn't think is right, trust me, he's not going to go to me and he's not going to challenge me as a, as, on major issues. No. We're not we're father son, so there's plenty of challenges that that come up. But he the difference between dogs and kids are dogs don't do things to spite people. Like people do things on purpose. Dogs don't have a bad bone in their body. Like all they want to do is make you happy. The problem is is if you don't establish yourself as their leader, as far as their pack mentality goes, they'll walk all over it because they're gonna become a leader and this little dog right now like she doesn't have to say i can't give you any affection she doesn't i'm not saying she can't hold i think she should hold the dog i think she should cuddle with the dog we do it when they're little but we don't do it in a way where we hold them up and let them walk all over us i hold them on my lap and i hold them on their back and i make them lay on my they can lay right on my lap but they have to lay with their belly up and they have to they can't squirm and they can't fuss and when they want to get down and they wiggle and wiggle and wiggle we don't let them get down like when we feed the dogs you watch us when we're little, little puppies I, we use feeding time as a reward based thing when you're calm and quiet and steady you get to eat I, it's an easy way to build in training so that's if I look at that I go you know what do that all the time you don't have to just do that at feeding time hold the puppy and when the puppy is settled and doing what you want it to do give him a little bit of praise so but you can't go you can't go like zero or a hundred all the time, like somewhere in the middle. And I'm always big on the idea of do a bunch of stuff with your dog as long as it's constructive. Like what you're doing is destructive, not constructive. You want to you want to give your dog a lot of praise and 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 give it a lot of reward because you love it so much. Great, make it do something that deserves it, and then reward them for it. So like instead of laying down on the ground and letting the dog walk all over you. Walk up to the dog and work on how can I get a dog to recall really well and sit for me when I ask it to sit. And when it does, I'll be able to give it the praise. Now, you have to monitor the level of praise. Just like you monitor the level of correction, you can't be blasting this little dog for every little mistake it makes because it should make mistakes. That's part of training. And you need to time your correction. But you also need to time your praise. So don't praise, so don't, I am, I am going to say, don't praise the dog for doing nothing. Because the dog doesn't understand, the dog's got to understand the value in your praise. So when you give them praise, make sure they did something. Then time your praise appropriately. And, and timing is a, we should do a complete podcast on timing because it's yeah. that important. But time your praise appropriately and then you'll, and then work towards more opportunities for it. You can praise your dog a lot. You should praise your dog a lot. It should earn the praise. So set them up for success. Avoid these situations that are just completely, um, you know, they're, they're, they're negative. Now, now it goes into the question of exercise. You got a, high, you got a dog with a, that needs a lot of energy. Hold on. Let's go back to okay. the middle first because the second question she said then is he steals stuff off the counter and runs under my bed, running all yeah. over the house. So can easy you fix. touch a little bit on place training? Easy right? fix. This is the easiest answer in the world. If your dog picks stuff up around your house, you've got a couple options. Again, it reverts back to earlier when I said set yourself up for success, avoid setting up for failure. It's this is like this is how elementary and simple dog training is. When we take a step back from it and we realize, oh my god, this makes perfect sense. So try this on for size. Your dog picks stuff up around your house and runs around with it. You've got a couple options of easy fixes. Here's the first option, pick the stuff up. Don't have stuff laying around your house that the dog can pick up and run around. Brilliant, right? I mean, that's not that's easy. If your dog picks up the shoes, I'm looking at the ground right now. I've got a pair of shoes sitting on the ground right next to us. We're in our kitchen. I've got a pair of shoes sitting on the ground, and I'm going, 
pick if I don't want a dog to pick those shoes up and run around with them, what should I do? Pick them up and put them in the put closet. Put your shoes away, Put babe. your shoes in the closet. And <laughs> Not if you put in the your, kitchen. If you put your shoes in the closet, your dog can't pick them up and run around. That's first thing. But here's my fi- here's my fix to that. I can put them in the kitchen. And I'm not worried. I mean, I can't because my wife gets mad. But <laughs> I can put them in the kitchen without worry of a dog picking them up and running off. Because what are my dogs doing? My dogs are on place. So when I teach my dog to go on its place, the beauty of place training is they go to a spot. They don't come off that spot. I'm not asking them to sit. You're not going to ask a five-month-old dog to plant its butt and stay all stay for an hour. You can't do it. But you can teach a dog that's five months old to get on its place. You can move around all you want. You can lay down. You can stand up. You can adjust yourself. You can move around as long as you don't have to go to the bathroom, which you got to monitor that. At five months, you're probably pretty pretty far along with housebreaking as long as you've been consistent. So now you put that pup on place and let him move around all at once on place. But it can't come off. And as long as you don't, you, who controls where the place is? You do. Who controls where the stuff is? You do. Don't put the stuff next to the place. Put the dog on the place. That's the easiest answer in the world. So I don't think that it's a problem with dogs. Well, here it can revert to, it can end up being a root of a problem. If you've got dogs that pick stuff up and run off with them, the last thing, this is a different question, but never chase them. Because you're going to train something into them that you're going to have to train out later. Dogs think it's a lot of fun to play keep away and chase. And especially if they have something in their mouth. They have something in your mouth. You don't want them to have it. You take steps towards them and run them down. They are faster than you at five months old. You don't catch them. This is fun. Let's do this again. Turns into a great game for them. Turns into the most frustrating game for you. So how do you get them? Recall them to you. Teach a recall. But wow, my dog doesn't come very well. Then turn and leave. At five months old, dogs don't want to be left alone. So you turn and walk away, and the pup is more than likely come towards you. The second he takes a step or two towards you, get down and go, come on, come on, come on, good boy, good boy, good boy. That's where you want the dog to come and attack you. You want to get the dog to come to you. So get down, get your little high voice. Here he comes. He comes to you. Praise him. Tell him how good he is. Tell him how good she is. Take whatever it is out of her mouth. Put the stuff away. Start place training, and now you don't get into that vicious cycle. So that's the fix to that. It's so interesting, I think, watching that happen, too, as an outsider when you see it, because it is your first instinct that you want to chase them, and you want to get whatever it is back as fast as possible. It's instinctive for them to run. But when you see it, you can see the switch that happens in the dog's head when all of a sudden... You turn around and go the other way, and they, they go, stop in their tracks, and they go, "Well, where is he going?" He's leaving. He's, <laughs> he's leaving. leaving. He's leaving. I gotta go find him. And then, so they take whatever it is, and then they run right to you. So and it's it, counterintuitive, and now, but and it now makes you're, so much. Now sense. you're creating the habit you want, and that's when you praise. That's when you t- lots of praise. So it's timing. If you if someone chasing you down and yelling at you, get your ass over here, just p- hollering, hollering, hollering. I'm gonna run. Do too. you really <laughs> want to come to that person? No, you're gonna turn and run. So you have, to, you have to, at that point, go 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, let the frustration get away, then go, come on, you little son of a gun, and call them to you. And when they come to you, you praise them, and then you set yourself up for success going forward. So that's that part. Now the last part. The last part is, I think, one of the questions we do get all the time, too, and it's about conditioning the dog and making sure that they burn off their energy. So she says a very hyper dog and he's not getting enough exercise so what does she do does she run him more or what's so, your fix for that so a lot of people say oh i gotta burn off the energy so i take him for a run before i ever do any training with them i take him for a run around the block i put it get on the four-wheeler and i run 10 run five miles then i can get him tired out well it's funny the more you do that the longer they go without getting tired because here's the here's the thing all you're doing is conditioning an athlete when you exercise a dog, now I'm not saying no exercise, but I'm also saying not 10 mile run exercises to tire them out because 10 mile exercises to tire them out creates a dog that can run 10 miles without thinking twice. Now you got to run 20 miles. Then you got to run 30 miles. You're just training a dog to be a runner. So in order to get dogs to focus, in order to get dogs to understand that we don't get like, what, what do you think repetition and inconsistency forms a habit. If every time you let the dog out of the kennel, in order to get control of it, you let him run wild for 10 to 15 minutes, or you get on an ATV and you let him chase you five miles down the road and five miles back. If every time the dog comes out of the kennel, 
you do that, what do you think the dog will assume is going to happen the next time he comes out of the kennel? What is his body going to say? I better get my shoes on because I'm going for a run. And so what does his mental state of mind say? I better get going because I'm going for a run. Ramp up, ramp up, ramp up, ramp up. And these little endorphins go off in their head and they go, yes, we're going for a run. Now, what do you want? You want a dog to come out of the kennel under control. You want a dog to come out of the control with a lot of patience and willingness to say, what are we going to do today? Where are we going to go? What are we going to work on? So here's the, here's the thing. I think you need to challenge. People want to tire dogs out by running them physically. I think you tire dogs out by challenging them mentally. So I would much rather a dog walk a mile or I'll be honest with you, I'd be, it's I'd much, I'd rather us. have a dog go 50 <laughs> yards and take 20 minutes, but he's under control on lead and he has to be in the right sink with me. He's got to be in heel position with me. He's got to stop and sit. I might incorporate a remote sit. I might do a reverse heel. I might do a few things that really makes my dog think left hand turns, right hand turns, concentrate on his footwork, all these things. And we might only cover a, a distance of 50 yards but it took us 10 to 15 minutes to do it rather than 10 to 15 minutes, an all out sprint down the road and back. The dog that goes 50 yards in 20 minutes will be more tired than the dog that ran 10 miles. And it's because we're balancing. There's a little bit of physical let off. He's getting, he's moving his feet a little bit. He's getting the blood going a little bit, but he's challenged mentally and that will tire him out way quicker than just physical. So when you mix those two together, now you're, but, but what are we doing? In the meantime, repetition and consistency forms a habit. The dog comes out under control. The dog has to think about his footwork. The dog has to stay in heel position. The dog has to do remote sits. The dog has to think about stuff and it's all slow motion. It's very, very controlled. It requires a lot of focus. It, you can't just be physically free burden it. You just can't physically just be mindless running. Like that's what the athletic dog that's conditioned to run long distances does. And it's, you'll have a hell of a time wearing them out. The dog that's stimulated mentally as much as they are physically tires way quicker. And, uh, and the habit that's formed throughout that process is the desirable one you're looking for. Control and focus the ability to be patient, the ability to think a little bit, not just come out the gates and go. So we have to challenge them as much mentally as we do physically. What else is on our question? Is that it? That was it, yeah. So I'd say to wrap it up, it was kind of three main questions, right? Do you have three bullet points then for it? The first one, she's sitting on the floor, the dog's attacking all over. Set yourself up for success. Oh, I, I think oh, you, I, to floor. be honest with you, I think <laughs> right. you can say set yourself up for success for all three of her parts right. of it. Yeah, so so training. become a leader. Become, yeah. a, become a leader and take control instead of letting a five-month-old puppy dominate the situation at all times. And that might mean, you know what, you might have to firm up a little bit. At times, you may have to be the adult in this situation and make adult decisions that but that's that's not hard to do you have you're you're being challenged by a five-month-old puppy i mean it's not that intimidating you can do it okay that's the first part second part set yourself up for success again incorporate some skills that you'll be able to transfer and translate into everything you do in life which will eliminate the opportunity for failure so pick stuff up where they can't get at it teach dogs to go on place so that they're under control and you eliminate a lot of the opportunities for dogs to get into trouble where they otherwise might. And the last one, challenge them mentally as much as you do physically. I, I challenge everyone listening to this, think about your next thing you're going to do with your dog. Make it, have an idea of how you're going to gain something from it and have it be both physical and mental. And I guarantee you if you're consistent with that, you'll see changes and you'll see changes in the right direction. That's it. That's it. Second podcast, right. man. Keep the questions coming, you guys. Thank you. Th- yeah, thank you for, for listening. We really appreciate it. Um, our goal is to help with with as many people as we can to help affect as many dogs as we can. So um, we're going to keep doing these. I thank you. If you would do me the favor, if you do like these, find someone that you know that you think could use some help with their dog. You probably, you may have a long list of them. You might be the person, but you might know somebody too. So if you'd share it with them, um, Check out our other stuff too, at Dogbone Hunters, all of our platforms. So 
Instagram, Best, yeah, Instagram Snap, Facebook, Facebook our website, YouTube, every, everything Dogbone Hunter. Dog Hunter. So, so appreciate it, and I look forward.